So I just want to give you a couple other examples that will, there's a couple more finer points of sample arguments that I would like you guys to understand. And the first one um, is here. So first of all, what if I said, what if I took this sample argument? First premise, most of my teachers are Democrats. Conclusion, therefore, I think most of my, um, most teachers in general are Democrats, right? So I went from most of my teachers to teachers in general. Hopefully you can see that that's not a diversified enough sample. And it's kind of like taking not enough apples from the barrel or from only one part of the barrel. Uh, so in order to have a diversified sample, we would of course have to talk to more teachers than just mine, right? If I, just the experience of one student and their professors is not enough to generalize to um, most teachers being that way and having the characteristic of being a Democrat. Right? So this sample is weak. It's not diversified, it's too small and it therefore uh, is a very weak argument. Now consider that in comparison to this next one. And this next one is gonna illustrate the point I'm making here. Um, so imagine someone says, look at the rash I just got from that plant. Let's just say it's their first premise. I got a rash from this plant. And they say, therefore, I'm not gonna go near that plant again. Right. Um, that's their conclusion. So I got a rash and that's the reason I'm not gonna go touch that plant again. Let's just say it's poison oak or something. Now this is a tricky one because although the sample is small, it's just that one person's experience, it's a diversified population. I'm, I'm sorry, the population is not diverse. The population is uniform, it's consistent because it's a plant, right? We know that plants are biologically the same. If I get poison oak once, do I have to go get poison oak six other times before I know that poison oak, when I touch it, gives me a rash? Probably one time is enough. You know, it's kind of like going back to the pie. I mean, we know how people make pies. It's not like they put all the sugar in one place and all the butter somewhere else. It's all mixed together. So a pie is a consistent population. That's why, even if I just have a bite of a pie, I kind of know how the pie is like because the population is pretty consistent. It's not like voting behavior where we see a lot of differences in um, beliefs and opinions about who should be elected in different parts of the United States. So the broader point I'm making here is that the sample itself, the, the thing you're talking about, the, sorry, the population itself, the thing you're trying to conclude about, that matters too, right? Like how, how diversified is it? How consistent is it? And so when you're evaluating these arguments, your critical thinking skills have to be on full alert. You have to recognize that um, plants are consistent, right? You don't need that many samples to know what to expect from a plant. People aren't, people's opinions are different. So whether an argument is strong does depend on the sample, but it also depends on what you're investigating and the nature of the population. Okay, so let me give you some examples of distinguishing between statistical syllogisms and sample arguments, because these can be tricky, like I said before. So I'm gonna throw an argument up on the board that says, I don't think camphor trees are deciduous. Deciduous is a type property of a tree. After all, ours isn't. I don't think camphor trees are deciduous. After all, ours isn't. Now let's say you're faced with a question on the assessment. Is that a sample argument or is it a statistical syllogism? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is remember what I learned in chapter one, which is how do I recognize a premise and a conclusion, right? Where's the premise, where's the conclusion? Because if I can tell the direction of the logic, then I can tell whether it's a sample or a syllogism. Remember, as we've seen, a statistical syllogism goes to a specific conclusion about a thing, and a sample argument goes to a general conclusion about a population. So if I find that the conclusion of the argument is general, it's likely that I'm dealing with a, um, a sample argument. But if I find that the conclusion of the argument is specific, then it's likely that I'm dealing with a statistical syllogism. And the knowing these things before evaluating these questions can help you understand the difference. So this would be a sample argument. I don't think camphor trees are deciduous after all, ours isn't. So I'm intuiting that the premise is ours. They're using their own tree as evidence for the broader claim that they don't believe camphor trees are deciduous. So the phrase after all is a premise indicator. Remember those from the first chapter, premise and conclusion indicators? After all, this is the case, therefore this must be true. Right? That's kind of what people mean when they say after all. Well, after all, we're gonna hit traffic, so we might as well leave later, right? 
we're going to hit traffic is the premise. We should leave later is the conclusion. So the same thing is happening here. After all, ours isn't. So that the premise would be, and let me just, I'll put this up on the screen. I'll write up the argument more formally in premise conclusion format. The premise of this argument would be, our camphor tree is not deciduous. Therefore, camphor trees are not deciduous. And notice now I can very clearly see this is a, this is a sample argument. By the way, it can always help you in questions on assessments when you write out the argument form um, in premise conclusion format. Uh, it, it often helps, I shouldn't say always, but it often helps uh, to understand what's being asked in the question. So in this case, now that I've laid it out, it's very clear it's a sample argument because it's using evidence of a specific case, the sample of their experience with a tree to make a broader claim about all deciduous tree, all, all trees having this um, all camphor trees, sorry, having the nature of being deciduous. Now compare that with this other one, same content, different direction of the logic. You pro your tree probably won't lose its leaves. Why? Because it's a camphor tree. So this will be thrown up on the screen, but one more time, your tree probably won't lose its leaves. Why? Because it's a camphor tree. This is a statistical syllogism. And the reason is, Consider the direction of the logic. What is the conclusion? What is the premise? Well, they come out right away with a conclusion. They say, your tree probably won't lose its leaves. Why? What is the evidence that this thing is the case? The evidence would be the premise. So the thing they say next, why? It's a camphor tree. That's why. The why is the reasoning, the evidence supporting the conclusion. So the reason that your tree won't lose its leaves, conclusion, the reason premise is it's a camphor tree. So this very clearly goes to a specific conclusion about your tree, which is what makes it a statistical syllogism. Now this one's also tricky because you have to draw from your previous knowledge from chapter one and two about unstated premises and conclusions. And this particular argument has an unstated premise. And that premise is that most camphor trees do not lose their leaves. So you can see that that's a logical assumption. Remember, an unstated premise can often be seen as an assumption of the speaker. The speaker is assuming that relationship, that camphor trees don't lose their leaves. He doesn't state it outright, but it's clearly part of their logic. So when you write it out all together and you've distinguished the premise and conclusion, you can clearly see the direction of the logic is to a specific conclusion, making it a statistical syllogism. 